This is Aliens and Artists, Part 2, with Mike Cleland. I'm your host, Stuart Davis. It's a plus show, plusers, patrons. Mike is an artist, author, UFO researcher, podcaster, and experiencer. In this episode, we explore litaphorical reality, moody moodiness of anomalous events, from whence hast thine come, and hither whilst thou decamp. And you can add Neutrogena 45 sunblock to the liminal lexicon of non-human entities. Also, owls and crows working in caw hoots. <laughs> Sorry. Mike's past life is a gray alien and what cured his severe clinical depression. But first... Mike, let me frame this up for a couple minutes as there's a bit of a runway to this first question. It was funny to joke about UFOs in the 70s and now it's not. The giggle factor is gone from the New York Times, gone from mainstream TV, Congress, the military. The gravity of the situation has set in a bit and it's a promising shift. So the first domino has fallen, let's say. Inevitably, other dominoes will fall, such as coming to understand that experiencers are also no joke. Many are humorous, but their experiences are valid, real, consequential. Further, reality itself is so much bigger than we can imagine, and it is populated with infinite multiplicity. At the same time, I thought a sea change might come back when John Mack went on Oprah with Experiencers, biggest show in the world, but in some ways it kind of backfired. To add insult to injury all these years later, we have Avi Loeb, also from Harvard, disparaging John without acquainting himself with John's work or the long history of contact events and Experiencer accounts. Avi is ignorant as to the significance of the enigma. He has intellectual prowess, but cognition is one capacity in a suite of talents required to meet this mystery where it lives, including intuition, emotional and spiritual intelligence, depth, development, and more. And even the most accomplished physicists are typically out of their depth when it comes to the phenomenon. John Mack, in my view, was not out of his depth confronting these puzzles. He wasn't perfect, but (laughs) he met it where it lived, so to speak. We have Eric Weinstein saying he doesn't want to hear from any crazy people who think they've been abducted. His strident ignorance is stupefying, adolescent reductionism. In the same way we cannot conflate advanced technology with wisdom, we can't equate high IQs with deeply developed people. It's just not true. Uh, It would be funny if it weren't for the fact that something has intimately braided itself with our humanity. Mocking that puts us at a great disadvantage. It's a huge liability. Now, Mike, you are a person possessed of great equanimity, (laughs) which is quite an accomplishment since you're also an artist to the core. How do you remain cool and grounded in the midst of the Avi Loeb's and the Eric Weinstein's of the world. I lose my shit once in a while, (laughs) and I admire your cool. Do you have a secret sauce for those of us wanting more of that in our lives? Well, I'm not perfect. So here, so something that I've been very open about in my personal writings and stuff, and I've been open about it in podcasts and in the books and stuff like that, I have suffered from severe clinical depression since the age of 12. And at times it has been very bad, like right around 30. It was, I went through an event when I was 30 years old, and that would have been 1992, 93. And then sometime around 96 or so like that, I actually wrote it up as an, as like a essay, like what happened to me in that darkest time. And, and like, I've been to a lot of therapists, like a lot of therapists. So it's really normal for me to sit and talk to a therapist. I know just, I know just how it works to be on that end of the, you know, on, on the couch. So I wrote this thing up and I, and I would hand it to therapists and say like, oh, here, do you want to just, before we meet next week, go ahead and read this. And this well, it's only nine pages long and tells you what I went through. And, and then they get back to me and they say, well, it's, I'm glad you're still here. Like I, I'm as a, 
professional, people who have these experiences that you're describing usually aren't around. Like, they usually commit suicide. And so I'm, like, I've had experiences that are way tougher than the UFO experience. So, and then I will say that, and I'm not saying, I'm not looking for sympathy or anything like that, because I, I feel like I'm in great a great place for the last, you know, seven or eight years now. So I feel like I, I kind of have a a baseline that I operate from, which I I never I didn't used to have. Boy, I was a I was a opinionated, loudmouth, arrogant to a lot of m- bunch of chapters in my life, and that has mellowed out greatly. And I think it has been, I can say that working really hard on myself and my history of depression has mellowed me out in a way that makes me a much more compassionate person, almost to a fault at times. Um, you know, like I'm, I like, I, I feel too much, I guess. So, and that I feel has been that aspect of my life, that chapter of my life has been really helpful. I've been taught, I talk about it. Like I've been unashamed to talk about like the history of depression. It's, it's a socially unacceptable thing to talk about. What I learned is that after going through it and dealing with it, it was at the forefront of my mind for decades. Like, how do I solve this? How do I work through this? How do I make sense of my life? Why do I feel like this? And I would talk about it at, let's say, a dinner table. Like, go to a restaurant, and you're, all your friends are there, and there's 10 people at the table, and you tell these stories. And, like, you can tell that nine people are freaking squirming in their shoes. Their toes, they're like, they want, they want the subject to change back to anything but what I'm talking about. And then one of them will come up to me later and say, thank you for saying that. You know, my my brother suffered terribly from that and or my parents did or my or I have and thank you for sharing that and and I learned very early on for myself I don't care about the nine people at the table I care about the one person who needs to hear it and so that has been that experience which happened before I started going and dealing with my going into my own self going into my own experiences and started dealing with the UFO contact stuff that was a baseline for me. Like, I don't care what the nine people at the table say. I care about what the one person gets if, they, if what I share is helpful, if it provides some solace. Yeah, just find one person to attune with. It helps. They don't even need to have a synonymous experience. One person being open and present to an experiencer saves lives. What else would you cite as the deciding factors for coming out on the other side of all that you've been through intact? Okay, so one of them was Prozac. Like, no doubt about it. Like a powerful drug produced by giant Big Pharma, right? The, the, the evils of Big Pharma. You know, like, I mean, that saved my life. Big Pharma, be like, yeah, you can, like, there's a lot of crappy stuff that, that you can point to Big Pharma about. But I'm here because of them. Uh, Prozac was one thing, really powerful. And then the other thing, which is going to sound a little flighty, but I, like, the book Conversations with God, it was a trilogy of books. Like, I read and read and read and reread that thing over and over and over again. And, and, and the combination, so here's, like, Conversations with God is a book that came out in the late 90s, a series of books by Neil Donald Walsh, and it's channeled. He's channeling God. Like, I like I don't know what is going on in that book, but what it did is it, it at its core, it just presented a really nice way to look at the universe, right? Like, here's, like, the world, our, everything around us, presented a very nice way to see it, and I needed that at the time, and I, and I would never have been able to tap into it without the benefit of Prozac to just slow down the the irrational monkey mind that like was was proving to be damaging to to the person I was so those two things one of them is a channeled book the other one is powerful psychopharmaceuticals um and then as far as like oh yeah there's lots of people tons of people tons and tons and tons of people that like just sat down and listened to me and talked with me and 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 checked in with me yeah yeah so like friends I'll I'll respect and love forever that I don't see anymore. And they just had one or two conversations with me and they were important. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I can think of a few. Kristen McEnany was super nice to me and would check in with me. And yeah, that was when I was living in Wyoming. So. 
Well, I love that in this conversation, empathy has been expressed for both alphabet agents and big pharma. Nice coupling, bodhisattva. And yes, sometimes the basic medicine is so big. Get sleep, exercise. Yeah, eat less sugar, yeah. Eat less sugar. And for you, Prozac. So many experiences are asking, what's the formula that will help me obtain wholeness? Let me switch to a little bit of a more prying question. I wonder what a typical day in the life of Mike Cleland's email box is like. It's, it's calmed down recently. Like I'm getting less than one a day now. Like I'm getting two or three a week. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, so you're asking like what my life is like as far as my email inbox. That's the joke I make. I, I, people say like, Mike, you know, what's the proof? What's your proof that this stuff is real? How can you prove this stuff is real? It's like, you want some proof? Come look at my email inbox. And I'm just me. I would say that like, look at Yvonne Smith's email inbox. You know, look at, uh, uh, I mean, look at your email inbox. I'm sure you know just what I'm talking about, you know? And <clears throat> so like, I used to be, one a day, one powerful owl and UFO story a day I would get. So you multiply that by a year, by 15 years. It's probably, it started, really started happening around 2009. So that's now, good grief, that's 13 years ago now. So, um, so you multiply that by 13 years, but it's ebbed and flowed. And so now it's trickling off and I am so grateful it's trickling off because I could not keep up with it. I could not keep up with it. It just was like walking uphill in sand. I would try to respond to each person individually. I tried to do a form letter that didn't work. I tried, tried, tried. I did my very best and I am doing my very best to get back to everyone. But it quickly became a full-time job, like answering these emails. And the stories are, are they all have the same flavor. They all have the same tenor, the same mood. So I get up in the morning, I check my email inbox, I send a note back, I could just, I got kind of a thing, it just flows out of me. Then I ask, you know, like, okay, what was happening? Okay, I, here's the here's the thing, I kind of hit this earlier. Like, you're not alone. I've heard, I haven't heard your exact story, but I've heard many with the same tenor or mood. What was going on before the event? What happened after the event? What are your psychic skills? And then are you a healer? And I usually don't ask that because they usually figure out a way to tell me. So that's been at the core of it. Now here's, so, so, so I, yes, I wish I could, you know what I wish I had? I wish I might just do this someday is just create like a GoFundMe thing and then hire a bunch of like grad students at the statistical analysis department of some college and say, come sit with me and let's build a monumental spreadsheet and crunch the numbers of the stories that have accumulated with owls and ufos because i got them all i got them all filed i'm doing my very best to keep them in order and date them and 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 but i am it's tough to see the patterns here's one pattern i'm seeing when i talk to so oftentimes i'll talk to people on the phone spend a few i spend a lot of hours every week talking to people on the phone about their owl and UFO experiences. And it's, it's like I've got, I'm not, I'm not clinging to the owl and UFO thing. Sometimes it's just an owl story. Sometimes it's just a UFO story. Sometimes it's just someone's mystical experience. And I would consider a UFO sighting a mystical experience in the truest sense of the word. So I, someone has had an owl and UFO experience. I have this thing. I just got paper. I take a single piece of paper. I write the date in one corner. I write their phone number on them. I talk to them. I put their name on it. We talk. And then in the, you know, I ask, I let them tell their story. I make some notes, not many usually. Enough so that if they call me back later, I can refer back to the piece of paper and remember that with their account. But but I do write. I take my pen, and off in the corner I write, Reiki, and I just wait. And then at some point, at some point, at some point they say, like, I say, what are you doing? What are you, what's anything, what's going on in your life? And they say, oh, I just got my level three Reiki, uh, Reiki master certificate. Certificate. I'm like, okay. And like, or they'll say, oh, I'm a working Reiki master. Or if they don't say that, they say, well, I work at this office and I'm doing this kind of form of hands-on energy healing. And I'm, so, so that's not 100% of the people I talked with. I, 
I have struggled with this number. I'm going to say it's over 50% of the people who have had owl and UFO experiences who contact me are either working professionally or just as a side thing as a Reiki therapist doing Reiki healing work. It's over 50%. I that to me says like something's going on. All and I'm I'm not a, I don't have a wide spectrum. I'm talking to people who have had UFO and owl experiences. Fifty percent of them who contact me are Reiki therapists, roughly. There is a there there. <laughs> Archives of the impossible opening at Rice University, including tens of thousands of letters from experiencers to Whitley Strieber. Jacques Vallée's life work, and much more. Have you heard of this? Oh, oh yeah, and I've talked to I've talked to Jeff. I, I'm planning Knockwood on going to that event. Yeah. What about having your life's work included? So honestly, I don't have that much. I mean, it fits in like it would fit in a shoebox. The amount of paper I've. I, but what about all the emails sent to you? Oh, oh, every email would be like you would you would have to yeah you would have to like take stock in a paper company to print it all out yeah yeah so, I think that it uh, is its own database. I want to crunch the numbers to those that, that I want to like see. I want to who are men having it more than women? When does it happen on a full moon? You know when does it happen on a Tuesday? Who is a Reiki healer? Who is not? You know I want all these answers. Yeah. So you brought up mood. You're a mood master. I sometimes get lost in the reverie of the way you shape a story. This is one of the most difficult features of the phenomenon to pin down. Also one of the most telling and revealing. Why is mood so important in anomalous experience? Nuts and bolts data quantifies cleanly. It's friendly with spreadsheets. But anomalous mood, high strangeness, the liminal, slips away like a bead of mercury from measurement. Do you feel the future of public discourse will ever come to include mood the way that you've been working with it? Wow. Okay. So, so this, is, this traces back to my own direct experience. Like that's what I'm struggling with is my, the strangeness, the subtle strangeness of this, this stuff and these synchronicities. So I'm, I put, so I, I wait completely equally. I wait owl story, UFO stories, synchronicities. I don't favor one more than another. Like there's certain researchers who would say, oh, the UFO thing, let's like ignore all that other stuff. And, but no, I wait them like a synchronicity is just as, is just as important as a as an owl sighting as just important as a UFO sighting. So the mood of a synchronicity, there's like a vibe. Synchronicity is one we we've all had them, right? It's part of the human experience to have that profound moment like, wow, how did this happen? How did this how did this one little strange event happen? Here I'll tell you this quick story. This is one I can tell quickly. Um very early on in this stuff, in this I am convinced this doesn't this i cannot defend or tell you why but i am saying this is a ufo contact story that i am going to tell because that's how it feels that's the mood of it i was working for the outdoor school this would have been around 2006 i think the spring of 2006 and i um did worked with some other instructors and we did what's called a seminar where we work among ourselves and such and and try to teach each other the anyway so we're in the mountains I get I have really sensitive skin and some sunblock makes my face get more red, right? It itches. Like I put certain sunblock on, and it's like, oh, it stings almost. And I'm like, I gotta find a sunblock that doesn't sting my face. And I ask people and they say, Oh, Neutrogena 45. And I asked the next person, oh, Neutrogena 45. I asked another third person, Neutrogena 45. And I was like, okay, I'll try that. So I came back to my town after after this seminar, which was in Wyoming. I came back to Idaho and I go to my little local um, health food store. And hey, do you have Neutrogena 45? And like, oh, no, we don't carry that. So I went to the drug store, the little locally owned drug store. And I was like, hey, do you have Neutrogena 45? I'm like, no, no, we don't carry that. So I'm driving home and there's a great big giant grocery store. And I was part of the small town when the grocery store went in. There was a lot of debate about this, you know, 
mega grocery store in this tiny, tiny little town. And so I was going to turn in and I like just didn't have the energy. So I didn't turn into the grocery store. So I'm driving home. And as I'm driving home, there are the, these big orange bags on the side of the road. And every springtime, this would have been in April, I think, <clears throat> April of 2006, they, the uh, springtime, they have a, like a community cleanup. People walk along the side of the road, they have these big bags, and they fill them up with trash, and they just leave them out there, and then somebody comes along and picks them up. So I was like, you know, I do this every once in a while, so I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'll, when I get home, I <clears throat> I didn't even go in the house, I just parked the car, I went in the garage, I got some plastic bags, I stuffed them in my pockets, and started walking up and down the, walking down the highway. And I figured I would walk from my house to the stop sign, which is exactly a half a mile, and it's right along the highway. And then I would cross the highway and then walk a half a mile back, so I'd do essentially one full mile which would be a half a mile both sides of the highway and and it and i started doing it it started raining right it's really ugly gross rain april cold and it's cold and miserable and then the rain just kind of turns this ugly sleet wet gray snow and and i mean i'm picking up like old cigarette butts and old like wrappers and and it's pretty gross and i'm filling up a bag and then i and then i see the stop sign ahead and i'm like I, there were at a point i said i should turn around and I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go all the way to the stop sign. So I've got to this, so I'm like, I can see the stop sign and picking up stuff and I get to the stop sign and I kid you not standing upright, leaning against the signpost was a bottle of, was a bottle of Neutrogena 45. <laughs> <laughs> the turnaround point, the point I picked a half a mile before. It was on a signpost, a signpost, and I had the most palpable, full body moment. That mood you're talking about, that like, how does this happen? Like I'm standing all alone. I can't turn to this other person next to me and say, "Hey, do you feel this too? Pretty weird, huh?" That was just me. I was wet. I was miserable. I was cold. I'm looking at this bottle of Neutrogena 45 leaning against the signpost. And I had the full body sensation, it's them. And that was really before I even know, could even wrap my mind around what that meant. It's them. And by them, I'm saying the UFO occupants. I felt it in my core. I don't have any proof of that. It's a fun story, right? It's got a little punchline and such. So uh, later, the big grocery store in town did, that one that I avoided, did have Neutrogena 45, and I do use that still, and it, it does not um, irritate my face. But that's like the, the synchronicity was the was all that led up to it. And And I will actually say the altruistic act of picking up trash for the community i would say is the most important component to that whole story that ties it all together this altruistic act like i'm going to do something nice for just for the sake of doing something nice and i was hit with this moment of it's them at a signpost that's a massive mood story and it makes me want to ask a two-part question about gauging humor. First, how often is humor present in your interaction with non-human intelligences? How is humor infused into mood, let's say, in these anomalous events? And part two being human altruism as a critical integer in the equation around how and why that event occurred. What are the others really looking for? What do they respond to? We project our anthropomorphic values on them. We imagine what we think might be magnetic to them, whether that's genetics, a particular skill set, etc. But that story points toward the altruism as the key element. First, can you speak to how humor infuses mood? And secondly, altruism is what showed up on their radar versus what we might imagine would show up. Do those make sense as questions? They make perfect sense. I might not be able to give good answers, and I'll tell you why in a second. So so let me just start with the first part, humor. So, like, my job was a cartoonist. Like, I was, did, I, that was my job for 
all the when I was a yuppie in New York, I was drawing, I was doing cartoon illustrations for advertising agencies and for uh, pre-production for TV commercials and stuff like that. So, um, like I was doing cartoons, and then after that, I got work doing magazine illustrations, instructional for climbing magazine, as well as a few other skiing and outdoor magazines and stuff. And then um, I started doing cartoon illustrations for these uh, instructional books, some of which were very popular on on lightweight backpacking, on telemark skiing, on um, uh, rock climbing and and such. So I, I, that was my job title. Like that's what it said. I said illustrator on my on my tax form. But, you know, I would tell people like, you know, people would. I said, you know, I'm a cartoonist. That's what I do for a living. I draw cartoons. So I, I had this like my job description was to be quirky and funny and irreverent. So how that influenced my my work, you know, it's funny when I when I went through, I put out a third book in 2019, and that was mostly blog posts that I boiled down and turned into a sort of a narrative, because that, because that that when I ran the blog between 2009 and and I kind of petered out around 2014, 15. I still put stuff on it, but at in 2014 I gave myself over, well 2015 really, I gave myself over completely to the um, the the writing of the owl books. And so everything else just evaporated, including my illustrations. I went, I went almost seven years, and I drew nothing, nothing. I was a full-time illustrator from the age of about 16 to the age of, what would that have been, 52. I drew nothing for six years. So in my writing i was funnier in my blog <laughs> than i am in the books i was trying to be a little quirky and funny and irreverent and i found that it didn't fit like i found that it was to just it, it like i had to i had to glean i had to clean some of that up it's still a little bit is in there um of the funny stuff that's in the uh of the blog you know there's like little funny things happening you know like i remember i i I have a little thing in my phone where i talk into my phone and i'm talking about owls all the time and owl is a funny word like the the little i would speak into the phone when i would instead of typing i'm a terrible typer on a phone and i would speak and i would often say the word owl and i remember instead of owl it was you know i spoke the word owl and it said how odd and to me that was like well that's i don't know if that's a mistake or not so you know so there's like this funny stuff that shows up and i think as a cartoonist, I'm I'm better suited to play with the. I mean, I'm basically like see the world as a giant caricature at times. You know, like that was my job was to show people with, you know, funny action lines and and little their pinkies sticking out as they held something. And I just see the world like that sometimes. You know, like the world is a giant caricature. So I I tried to sneak that into my work a little bit, and then there's events that showed up. I, the problem is I can't think of anything right off the top of my head right now. Oh, well, here's one, like the freaking door, my door. Uh, like that I lay in bed and I face the bedroom door and I sent a picture to you. There are two owls that are unmistakably in that door, and below them are two aliens. And it is you don't you do not have to blur your vision to say like there's like two aliens, like gray aliens with the big black eyes. And there's two amorphic giant cartoon owls like rising out of the two amorphic cartoon aliens like it's there and and i didn't do that like i I didn't make the door the door's been in this house for i don't know 30 years and i just like saw it and and once you see it you can't unsee it um so i'm like i feel like i'm really heavily predisposed to see the goofy quirky thing that a you know the like an annoying fourth grader would see and point out um that's still in me that annoying fourth grader to 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 greater or lesser degree sometimes um and then the altruism thing i used to have a few examples of that and i'm drawing a complete blank because i remember at the time thinking oh the altruism thing shows up in something else where another synchronicity happened when I was, but I, I'm drawing a blank now as far as that. But I, I have noticed that in a pattern, not only in my synchronicities, but other people's synchronicities, that that act of kindness shows up. Like doing something 
out of kindness, out of altruism, seems to, and it's not just a synchronicity involving aliens. It's just a normal, you know, run of the mill, powerful though they may be, but it has no tie in to, to, let's say, UFO contact. And the only reason I tied the UFO contact in with the bottle of sunblock at the base of the sign was because of the absolutely palpable thought that was instantaneous, that was it's them. And by it's them, I meant it's the aliens. That's the only thing in that story that's connected to the UFOs. But that felt real at the time. Fascinating. And I affirm your take on the doors in your house. You shared some photos with me, and it's not pareidolia. It's the owls and the aliens in the grain of the door. Like the Neutrogena 45 sunblock, Another instance of contact without contact, the environment itself is the phenomenon's canvas sometimes. So altruism was key in the mood of that contact event you shared, that liminal signaling from the aliens. They noticed your altruism and responded to it in kind. At the same time, every kind of human being experiences contact, abduction healing interventions. Everyone from psychopaths to saints experiences these events. So to what degree do you believe a human being's level of self-realization, wholeness, or goodness operate as attractors to contact? Ooh, okay. So so when I wrote the book, the, uh, the first book, like I stumbled on, I just, I said, I got I got all, I got, like, been doing this research, I've been collecting these stories, I've got some blog posts I can tap into, I've, so I've got the wealth of material that I got to coalesce and boil down into this book. And in doing so, and I've said this, like, this is no joke, like, I would be, like, working on a chapter, and I was like, eh, this chapter feels like it's kind of, like, not quite done, and then I don't know what it needs, it just needs that one oomph, you know, and then ping, like, the UFO would come in, maybe not simultaneously but it sure felt like at times simultaneously and it would be the exact story the exact perfect owl and ufo story to fold into that chapter and then like oh the chapter is now complete it now has its unity it now and now so in the end of that creation of the book like i kind of at the end i kind of say like i did not expect to write a book like this what happened is the overall flavor tenor mood of the book is something benevolent something altruistic something something life affirming for me it was and i was you know like i i I was probably i was trying to be objective i wasn't i was being subjective i was i was i was writing the book i wanted to read in essence you know so i was kind of flavoring it the way i wanted to and so what emerged was this altruistic book the second book was a, was at the end of that book i i figured which was the second book was a set of stories this 19 chapters basically they read like 19 short stories and at the end of it i was like wait a minute all these people not all of them but the great majority of them are healers like healers people who do healing work and and i didn't expect that so the so like there's embedded into this is this healing aspect the the, the thing about people being Reiki healers who have owl and UFO experiences, the the issue of um, the people. So I'm, I'm not looking at the big broad spectrum. As I said before, I'm looking at this narrow sliver of people who have UFO and owl experiences. And these people, by and large, this is a, this is a estimate without any data to back it up. This is just my, my, my gut having, looked at this as that these people are in these people are healers these people are seekers these people are very giving nurturing people that have had these experiences and it sometimes it shows up in their job whether they'll be reiki healers or nurses or psychiatrists or shamans wow a lot of people show up shamans and so that aspect is interwoven into my work so i I, I, there's a line, I, um, I'm going all over the map here, but I talked to a fellow named Dr. Kirby Surprise, who wrote a book about synchronicity. And in that book, he said, I 
like to create my own synchronistic experiences, and the way I do it is I make owls. And when I read that, I was like, oh, I got to talk to this guy. And and so I eventually talked to him. I don't know if he's a shaman himself, but he has a wonderful mystical quality to him. He's a clinician. He works in like totally mainstream therapy settings. And, but he said, he talked about, he said, you know, I'm getting all these synchronicities. My life is full of all these synchronicities. And it has to do with owls and UFOs. I'm putting a lot of energy. I'm obsessively researching owls and UFOs. And I'm getting synchronicities that have to do with either owls or UFOs or both. And he said, well, that should be expected. You are, you are dealing with two highly charged totems, the owl and the UFO. You're putting a lot of energy into it. You should expect that the universe reflects it back. It's not, you're, you're at your wit's end. You're seeing this as something frenetic and something unsettling and something you can't control, but you are putting the energy out into the universe. The universe is reflecting it right back. He said something, I've got to do this quote right. He said, we are all just parakeets in the cage, pecking at the mirror, not realizing it's our own reflection. And so me obsessively looking into owls and UFOs, it produced a somewhat obsessive collection of books. I mean, you can feel the obsessive quality in those things. Like You can you recognize that like poor Mike is, is like struggling with his own madness in a way and need to, needed to pour it out onto the page. And, and so for me, I've been like, I'll say the work I, the outdoor work I did, I would say the very grounded, centered home life I had to, to a great degree. And, uh, like that created a person that was, that was capable of stepping way out on the line and doing this and, and. I, I'm being I'm from Michigan. I'm being very cautious to say that I'm like a nice altruistic person because I can get just as grumpy as anyone else and selfish and all the other things. But but I recognize that within those books is a mood of kindness, sweetness, and altruism. It's 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 in those books. And and I put it there on purpose. It didn't happen by accident. I kind of wanted it in there and I wanted it in there because that's that's the kind of books I want out in the world. But that those are the rip I want those kind ripples in the pond and I want to be generating those ripples. So compelling. I am familiar with Kirby and his work and there's a contrarian streak in me that bridles at wholly framing the phenomenon in a liminal archetypal function of our own consciousness. I agree those are definitely constituents of the puzzle, but I get worried when it's relegated to that one position. The idea that the manner in which we inhabit the cosmos to a great degree determines our experiences of it. Well, what about the Holocaust? Do we think the Jews created the Holocaust because it was a function of their individually projected consciousnesses? With abductees and contactees, this is a chicken and egg question. Did my trauma put me on the radar? Or did these beings put trauma in my life? Is there a resonance I don't understand between the two? Do sensitivity and depth magnetize us to painful events? Or are painful events employed to evoke sensitivity and depth in experiencers? Does ontological shock accelerate the developmental process? Do they see it as the quickest route from point A to point B in a person's evolution? Chicken egg. Oh, I struggle with that chicken and egg question a lot. Yeah, so so uh, just rein me in if I go around the block too many times. So so the first thing is the um, the shamanic initiation, right? So if you in in well, let's see, I'll use the term primitive cultures in cultures like non-Western cultures. Uh, you're in the jungles of Brazil, or you're turn the clock back a few hundred years, and you're in the plains of South Dakota. The tribe needs a shaman, right? The old shaman dies. There's a need to have a new shaman. Nobody volunteers to be the shaman. Maybe nowadays people say like, oh, I'll take a little class and I'll become like a little shaman and whatnot. That's that's not the traditional setting of it. You don't get to pick. I mean, if you, like the, the village, 
goes through a ritual and figures out who's going to be the next shaman. Oftentimes it's a child who has been through some sort of crisis. Uh, Stanislav Grof and and, uh, Joseph Campbell used the term shaman sickness, some sort of psychological break, some sort of some sort of unhealthy, what we would call in the West unhealthy. Like so, so some kid has a, as a ten-year-old has a psychological break, and we doctor him up with medications. I have I reap the benefit of medications. I understand that, but in a primitive culture, that that child would be recognized, and and that child may be taken into the role of the shaman. They don't get to pick it. So, and then the initiation is oftentimes symbolic of trauma, right? They'll like lock the kid in a cave um, and then they'll let him come out of the cave. So there's a symbolic sort of death and rebirth, but it's Trump, you know, you get locked in the cave or they'll, they'll, they'll beat you to the edge of death or they'll, you know, like hang you by your skin through eagle claws and like, so for the whole village to see, you know, this is, there's like brutal traumatic initiation rites to someone who didn't volunteer for it. And they become the shaman. So this is right out of John Mack's Passport to the Cosmos, a book where he compared and contrasted the shamanic initiation rites of ancient cultures to the modern UFO contact experience. You A plus B equals C, sort of, you know, right? So so the, like so what you could say is like, well, the UFO abductees, given that model, the UFO abductees are society's new shamans like i'm, I'm going to be very cautious saying that because like, like there's all kinds of rays that doesn't play out but given john max model and how it compares that that would be the shamanic thing there um what was the first part of the question the dicey move of reducing the mystery to merely our own projected consciousnesses writ large on the cosmos Perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, so my thought in that as a researcher, as someone, so like, th- I didn't write the book for, I, yeah, I, I wrote the book for me, right? I, that was, those books are like me, like wrestling with my own demons. Those were for me. Those books are my, <laughs> like, I couldn't go to a therapist. I tried going to the therapy and like, they, they just like, I was like, they couldn't, like, I was on a different plane. Like, oh, you know, it wasn't like I was talking about my rough childhood, which wasn't that rough, it was fine, really. And then I, but I would, say like oh i had these ufo things and i just realized like oh like i can't like unless it's a like it wasn't working trying to go to therapy so i started writing books and a blog and stuff like that and doing a podcast that was my therapy and that's what emerged in those big fat books um i tried to go around the garden and take a little pollen from every flower little big flowers little flowers little weeds off in the corner big beautiful flowers that you know in the center so dr kirby surprise and his ideas and his thoughts and stuff was was just a little yellow fluff on the bumblebee's legs you know that was just i was just collecting that stuff and and trying to boil it down you know in a for myself you know, so so like yeah, Doctor Kirby Surprise. He's got a gr- I mean, he's got a very interesting framework, methodology, like way of trying to address the mystery of synchronicity. Some of it feels really right, some of it doesn't. But but I but I tried not to weigh that. I just tried to tell the story of my interaction, my inter- So here's what I can say: my personal interaction with Doctor Kirby Surprise was so rich and so reassuring and so perfect it was what i needed at that moment in my life i needed to go to dr kirby surprise ask questions and i benefited enormously from his gentle voice so that's what i'm concerned with i don't i'm not his ideas are one thing his helpful nature in my journey is something else entirely and that's what that I, that is a thousand times more important than the nuances of his ideas. So I, I, I recognize that in myself and in my writing and in my journey and how I present that stuff. And I try to make it clear that I'm not weighing anything more than one more than the other. So you kind of got to go when you're speculating, you kind of got to go off in corners and speculate and get a little lost and come back and then try to refine your, your path again. So that, that's how I would answer that. What you just shared confirms how two people connected and attuned that in and of itself being healing. It's not about having identical worldviews. 
If you can be in the presence of someone with depth and presence, it kickstarts the healing process. Do you feel like that's a fair characterization of that dynamic? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And some of it was just gentleness. Just some some people were just just out and out sweet. Um, um, I wrote about meeting with uh, Jacqueline Smith, the the woman who had you know who does animal communication and psychic works. You know, I I recorded the call that she's channeled for me, and she came up with some beautiful information channeling. But I would say it was her energy. She has a very sweet nurturing energy and i i like she could have said anything and i would have benefited you know with with the the phone calls i had with her as i was moving through this process so her her channel she channeled an owl for me it's kind of a long story but in that she like basically i said hey like like can you channel this owl she said talk to this owl can you channel this owl and 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 you know, like if you see this owl again, you ask it for me. Like, what's up with owls and UFOs? And then she started talking this halting voice, and she basically said, she said two things that like that like made the puzzle pieces of my disparate research click together. Right? She said, the owls are an archetype. Bam! Everything clicked together. And she also said, the owls are here to announce initiation. And bam, it all clicked together. Now, you look at what she said. It sounds a little bit like, I'm going to be very cautious because she's a wonderful, caring person. Like, you could read it and it could sound like like a New Age aphorism, you know, as opposed to what it was, was it was a vital point in my research where, where, I, where my research became concrete and valid given, given what she shared. The owls are archetypes and the owls are here to announce initiation. Let me change lanes and ask you about screen memories. I have toggled back and forth between sometimes feeling screen memories are a compassionate form of insulation for us, other times feeling they are an obstructive manipulation of our personal history. Another third form of thought might be their unresolved nature sends us on a mission, on a hunt to know what's behind that screen, that memory. How do you feel screen memories situate in the menu of intentions, of objectives from these non-human intelligences? Okay, so so when I did the first book, I had, I put the screen memory in there early, and I told some really good screen memory stories, and then I just moved on. I wanted to just, like, get past it. And what happens is, is really, <laughs> so... People who have written books and like do podcasts, and it's I know what it's like to do a podcast and, and host it and stuff like that. So it's human nature, but you can I can tell when people only got to that screen memory chapter of the book and then didn't read the rest of it because they try to frame the whole talk about screen memories. I'm like, well, you know, I kind of I kind of want to I, I kind of put that in there to like so I could move past it, so I didn't have to get stuck there. But yeah, so if you if you so there's she's actually in the house here right now. I like live in a house. My roommate is what well, was one of the people. That's how I was one of the people in the first book, and her pen name is Lucretia Hart. And she she told a story where she was walking um, between two camps. She was working at a summer camp for kids, and there were a girls' camp in there. So there was girls at one campsite, and she was walking to the other campsite, and it was just in another spot of the woods, and she was on this trail, and she was 19 years old. She knew full well she had had UFO contact experiences, but they'd always happen at night. Full daylight, bright, beautiful day, sun is shining, she turns a corner, standing next to the trail is a gray alien in full daylight, and she said it was just so, it was so jarring to see its big, chalky, white, bald head reflecting the sunlight. And, and this thing looks at her, and she looks at it, and it and she says, this thing had this, like, 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 how did you see me? Like, how did you find me? <laughs> kind of expression. And she heard a voice in her head that said, owl, 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 owl. And she, like this, this reverberating telepathic, it's reading my mind at the same time. I'm reading its mind. And, and it was owl, owl. And she watched this thing morph into a giant four foot tall owl. And it turned around and walked into the woods. And so, like, what's the role of the, I mean, it could have said anything, could have said deer, 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 could have said cat, 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 it could have said anything. So, but it said owl, 
and I and that and that story is a beautiful example. That's where like someone actually saw the alien morph into the screen memory. I have a few of those stories in my files. Not all of them are owls. Some of them are deer and cats and such. But the so they quite you know why owls? The question why owls? So I, I'm going to go on autopilot a little bit here, right? So the 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 UFO investigator, I asked Bud Hopkins this question, you know, well, why do they pick owls? And Bud just shrugged his shoulders. Well, you know, the owl sort of looks like the alien, right? They got the big eyes, you see them at night. So they kind of look the same, and that's why they pick them. And, and I, like, I was a little kid who, when my mom said, you know, like, oh, you know, you should clean your room up, I wouldn't clean my room up. So when Bud Hopkins says, oh, that's the reason why, I, I like, the little kid in me was like, oh, yeah, like, like, I'm gonna figure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out a way to, like, it doesn't, I don't buy it. So, so why are they using the screen memories? People have asked them. Like there's dialogue within the UFO literature of people saying like, you know, why are you using the the owl? Is it the, like people will say you will remember us as an owl and they are going to be tough to pick us. But the implication is that it's not jarring, right? So if you see an owl on the side of the road, it's much less jarring than seeing a gray alien. So they're doing it to soften what would be the traumatic response if we saw an alien. And then they also do it for other things. And, you know, some of it is pretty creepy. I've heard, like, people, like, oh, what's her name? Um, uh, oh, I can't remember the author's name. Just talk, but, but there was a story of a woman at her home, and she was, like, all of a sudden, she's like, oh, my God, I, I just feel so tired. I feel so tired. So she laid down on the couch, this, like, unnatural sense of tiredness. And her husband walks in to the house, and she realized right away, it's not my husband. And she was like, how dare you, like, use my husband as your screen memory? You know, and then she had what amounted to a contact experience that evolved. But they, but they, but she was angry. Like, how dare you use my husband? And I have another friend whose dead mother... She has a story of her dead mother. It's a very close friend of mine. She has came down through the roof, like whoosh, passed right through the roof, landed on the staircase and walked down. And she struggled to tell this. She said, it did not move like my mother. It moved in this eerie, flowy way. I did not like it. So there's, I feel like there's all these stories of screen memories and I think they're just they're there as a marker or as a way to to lessen the impact on the observer. The aliens are not or whatever they are, these these beings that are not us don't understand us in some fundamental way at times. And then they show up thinking, well, I'll just show up as this woman's mother and that'll calm her down. It didn't calm her down, it had exactly the opposite effect. You know, I'll just show up as this woman's husband. It did not calm her down. It made her angry. So I think that there's there's oh my God, there's such a wealth of stories. It you could you could cherry pick the accounts you want and make it fit the narrative you want it to be. And I recognize that's a that's a that's a very easy trap to fall into. So you asked a question. My sense is they are using the screen memory for two reasons. One, to lessen the impact of the of the traumatic sighting of an alien. And the other would be they're using the image of an owl or of a deer or as a mother. Jesus shows up in some screen memories. They are using these are all archetypal images. Mother, owl, deer, Jesus, the and more. Some of them are kind of benign clowns. Well, that's actually pretty archetypal too. Uh, firefighters. There's all kinds of things that show up in these screen memories, but they can be seen as an archetype. So the the they are presenting themselves as an archetype for the same reason that a ancient myth would have an archetypal animal embedded into the storyline of the myth. I have no proof of that. That's just a feeling I have. In my own life, I've had anomalous events involving owls, coyotes, mantis insects, the greatest hits of <laughs> archetypal forces to enjoin. 
What I find weird is that my totem animal is the crow. No contest. And the crow is an archetype, but we find, or I find, zero crows as screens appearing in contact that I'm aware of. Any thoughts on this or why no crows? Okay, so so I would say, oh, I, there's crow stories out there. No problem. There, I've got some crow stories. In more in synchronistic stories rather than, than uh, screen memory or anything like that. But I know a lot of, I know some experiencers. I could name some names. I'll choose not to right now, but I could name some names of people who have had crow stories. Oh, Denise Lynn, who who very cautiously says, I'm not an experiencer. And I'm kind of like, well, you sure got all the things around you that sound like experiencers. Denise Lynn is an author and she writes um, kind of, I don't want to say self-help books, but spiritual books. She's written a lot. She's actually a wonderful voice in this in this field. Um, but she's had a crow experience where she, I can't, I can't remember this exactly what was going on now. I think she was reading Whitley Strieber's Communion. I think I've got this right. She was reading, reading Whitley Strieber's Communion, looked out the window, and there was an owl and a crow on the same branch staring in the window at her. And so owls and crows are traditionally enemies. Like, usually they harass each other, probably because they want the nests. They're like, you know, territory and nests and things like that. And I'm going to step back a little bit, and I'm not like a, like a skilled folklorist, but the owl is usually symbolic of the night in the in the subconscious. And the crow is symbolic of the day. Crows come out in the day and they are symbolic, well, not so much as eagles and things like that, but they are but they are less an unconscious totem and more a conscious totem. You know, where most daylight animals have that, you know, and nighttime animals have a have a cats, for instance, have a have a lore of the unconscious in in animals of the day have a lore of the the conscious mind like eagles and hawks and crows and ravens but yeah we have that so the, the very powerful totem animal and they do show up in the lives of experiencers in very very synchronistic and symbolic ways i think but i've never heard of them as a screen memory but but yeah oh yeah they're they're there the stories are there last question it's a doozy I'd love for you to share some about your past life as a gray alien. <laughs> <laughs> how much? How much time do I have for this? I can tell you. Oh, I got no. I've got no problem telling it. So cool, cool. Uh, what category would you put this in? Actual, metaphorical, literal, imaginal, uh, prismatic weave of all of those at once. And what year was this? Where did you do this? When did you do this work? 2018, 2017 and 2018. So that was two years, like a, basically separated by roughly a year. I had two separate hypnosis sessions and the exact same story emerged. It was like watching a Brady Bunch episode, you know, in rerun. It was the exact frame for frame story emerged. So. Okay, great. Can you share how it feels to you now? these various hypnotic nodal points? Well, there's another separate nodal point because I had a, a uh, past life regression in 2014 to look into my, and, and I, I talked with a woman, it was at a UFO conference, and she did past life regressions. And I kind of said, oh, you do hypnosis therapy. How about looking into my UFO thing? And we sat and talked, and I talked about my issues and this and that in my life. And she said, you don't need a, hypno a UFO thing. You need a past life regression. I'm like, great. Like, So we went in there with the intention, the, the intention of coming to terms with my, with my depression, solving that in my life. And... I was, I can't remember how long it was, about three hours, I was like on this big recliner chair and she was talking me through these events and, and the story emerged, which I don't think is true. And I can say almost the same thing with, this, uh, with the UFO contact story. Under hypnosis, a story emerged, which I don't think is true. But I take it both stories very seriously. And it was, I, I, how much time do we have? Because <laughs> I... Okay, so, 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 okay. So I sit in her recliner chair. She puts me under. She takes me back to this previous life. It kind of shows up in these little snapshots, very similar to, to the UFO memories that have emerged under hypnosis, which are kind of like, again, like, I, I don't know what to trust. So 
Um, and this is completely separate from the UFO thing, but like, I mean, can they both be true? So here's what happened. I lived a life, if I take her story seriously, in the 1920s, and I was a young art student. I was very arrogant. And I remember I was kind of like dressed really nice. I was in, I, I felt like I was in the UK somewhere. I was in England, it felt like. And I remember being on the streets with the little, like the little diamond shapes in the windows, the, the leaded glass in the windows. I remember very clearly seeing that. And, and, and I was, and I remember I had like full head of hair and like, can you imagine the 1920s with your grease your hair and you comb it back and stuff? And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm bald. I'm like, oh my God, I have hair again. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, it felt so good to play with it. And I was like dressed really nice and stuff like that. And I was like, and I remember saying like, I think I'm sort of a, like, I think I'm sort of arrogant. Like I'm kind of a, like I'm kind of, I was really talented at art school. And I was like, I think I'm sort of a dandy. And I, and I, and I actually said, I think I might be gay. And I, and I just kind of moved on. And it was like, you know, like I just really felt like I was, I just had this kind of arrogant presence about myself. And then, and I was doing pen and ink work. I remember that. I was white paper, black ink, fine line pen, which is just what I do now. And I, and then it just sort of shifted a little bit. And, and I'm lying there in the chair. And I say, something's wrong with my face. Something's wrong with my face. And she said afterwards, I looked at you and your face swelled up. When you said that your face was all puffy, it got all swollen. I didn't remember this at all, but she said she saw my face get puffy and swollen. And I said, someone's beaten me. Someone has beaten me. And now, and now I'm blind. They've beaten me so badly that I'm blind. And she goes, who beat you? And I said, my father. And I said, what happened? And I said, after he got so, so guilty, that he beat his own son, that he committed, he drank himself to death. He drank himself to death. And I cried for, for, I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And some other stuff came up and there was about the convalescence and about my time, like, and I just, I just kind of faded away as a person. And I didn't, I just like, and And when I came out of the session, she counted back from 10. I remember sitting up in the chair and just saying, like, I just knew I am cured. I am cured. And I can say, I used to knock wood. I don't do that anymore. I'm saying it. I'm saying it. I am cured of severe clinical depression. You know, like it rains a bunch of days in a row. Something doesn't go right. I can be down. I can get the blues. I know what that feels like, but that's not clinical depression. I was cured from that wild, irrational story. So in my other story, which if you take it literally, says that I was a gray alien in some other incarnation and I incarnated here, I was born here on earth to play some role. Well, wait a minute, what, can, I, can I be a young art student in the 1920s and a gray alien? I mean, I, 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 I don't know, I really don't know. Like some, no, that's impossible. And then on the other side, well, I guess anything is possible. I mean, I'm trying to balance those things in my mind. At the same time, the stories are, are absurd. Here, I'm gonna, so, so I struggle, struggle, struggle. Here's, here's the way I've dealt with this. This happened just recently. This happened less than a year ago. A guy calls me, he's got UFO and owl experiences. He gets a hold of me, he said, let's talk on the phone. I'm like, great, so we talk on the phone. So this guy has had, powerful ufo experiences he had a near-death experience that's unbelievable i don't want to tell too much about this guy he also does ghost hunting and he's got like a an evp you know one of those little evp recorder things that like you you get the voice of the you go to the haunted house and you say you know like who is in the house and then that love voice comes through it you know on the on the little machine it's like ghost hunting reality shows are rife with these things so he's got his so i call him up and he answers the phone, and and it was just like within the first few seconds of the phone call, and in a very clear voice in the background, a woman says, do you need a fairy tale? As plain as can be. And he just, and then he goes, well, that was weird. My, my EVP thing is on the desk right next to me. It just turned on all by itself. 
and I just heard this voice come out of it. And I was like, that was, and I said, that was for me. I heard, he didn't hear it that clearly. He said, did you hear what it said? I, I said, I heard exactly what it said. It was a woman's voice playfully saying, do you need a fairy tale? And, and that, like the, there's the aspect of this thing that just, that just blows my mind over and over again is how uniquely tailored these powerful events, whether they be synchronicities or a mystical event where an EVP voice recorder turns on all by itself, blurts out this line, the guy sitting next to it doesn't hear it, I hear it clear as a bell, it says, do you need a fairy tale? That has been my existence. I love, I need the story. You were asking like, well, is the, is the, what's the literal thing? I mean, were you literally a gray alien in a different lifetime? And I asked myself, was I literally an art student in the 1920s that got beaten up? You know, I, what I, I, I can't answer either of those questions, but I, what I do say is I love the story. I, even if, like, like a fiction story, you can go to see a movie that's not based on fact at all. You can have a powerful, rich, rewarding, emotional experience sitting in the dark. And I, and I think these things are presenting themselves as stories, as fairy tales. A woman's voice asks me, do you need a fairy tale? The answer for me is unquestionably, yeah, yeah, I love fairy tales. I love weird mythic things that I have to like struggle with and debate and like come to terms with. And, 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 and I, I get stuck when I have to when I have to say, oh, is this, was this real? Did this really happen? I get, I get locked up if it like, well, it doesn't make sense because I have these two conflicting things. How do I make, like, both cancel each other out? Then neither should be, you know, like, how, uh, uh, I just, my, I, my brain seizes up. But if I take two steps back and say, what, these are really good stories. These are, and there's a lesson in these stories. There's a value to these stories. People have told stories around the campfire, Jesus told his disciple stories. We get all, you know, we, we stand in line at a movie theater to see Star Wars. You know, these stories are part of our human existence. So I am content to just back off and say, like, who knows? Maybe the person's lying to me in some of the events. I, I, I don't think it happens very often. But I have been collecting stories, archiving stories, sharing what I can. And many of these stories, like this involve me and I am totally at peace and content with the story rather than the pragmatic did it really happen like I just I've learned to just push that away and not stress at all about that but I revel in the story itself mm. do you need a fairy tale we have more ability for holding our experiences in that indeterminate vitality saying I don't know was that a fey entity, an extrojection of my own being, a quasi-tulpa? But we don't turn that same reflection to our own identity, typically. Our own personality. Us as story beings. Or do you, Mike, do that? Do you turn the same lens on Mike Cleland as a character in this cosmic theater? Do you feel yourself to be as permeable, as ephemeral, as liminal as the others often seem to us? Wow. I try to look at myself as a character on the stage. You know, am I writing the script? Is someone else writing the script? Are we co-writing the script? Are we writing it in real time? Has the script been re written in advance? And I'm just, just like on the conveyor belt of, of life, like fixed and unable to, to step out of the bounds of the story that's already been written. Like I struggle with this stuff all the time. Like, and I'm all over the map. At first, early on, these types of things made me crazy, like crazy, insane, <laughs> obsessive, like, like unhealthy. I was, it was an unhealthy distraught life I was living, trying to deal with these events in my life, these, but most of them in the form of synchronicities. I had a confirmation event, which is a long story. It's in the book. It's in two books, actually. Um, I tell it twice, but it's a long story. But at the end of a 
collection of like story upon story upon story and when they all kind of you tied them all together and looked at them and literally as a line in a map i was like oh i'm all, i'm done like what do you, what do you, you cry uncle like when they like you you know you get tackled by all the kids in the neighborhood you know like all of a sudden i was like just like tackled pressed to the you know like like the 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 like i was helpless in the face of what i had experienced and i just said oh it's real it's real now what it is is like as an ephemeral question but it's real right i mean is it is it aliens in a flying saucer is it just the grand spectrum of 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 interplay of consciousness and 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 physicality that that interweaves human experience like i like i can't answer that but i can say it is real whatever it is and it has intersected my life and i got to suck it up and deal i could turn my back on it but it would just it would just bubble up and boil over in some other way and i know that so i got to face it head on is it so that the, you know like that's my that's been my like ugh that's been my like core question is it metaphoric is it real am i dealing with a metaphoric something or a reality something now yeah, like so you know ufo's leave a burn mark in the in the in the lawn right and you can go out there and test that and you can go take soil samples and you can take it to a lab and you might find some interesting results if you if you run all that diagnostic stuff Physi- it's physical right and then there's this ephemeral stuff there's like people have psychic things that don't lead anywhere they like like the like you it leads you on an absurd little chase to nowhere or you know it leads you on a chase where you're thinking going one direction you think you're going to solve one thing this important epiphany is going to happen and then something much more playful happens or something much more dark happens so i i have to for my own sanity just back off and relish it as a story and then for me my cleland like I, like I look at my life and think, like, wow, did I just take some wild U-turns in the middle of my life? And one of the strangest U-turns, and I'm almost sixty, so I like feel like I'm looking at the end of my life is a lot closer than my birth at this point. And I'm like, well, what, like, what, what cooler, more dynamic, more exciting thing could have happened than for me to be confronted with magical mysteries mysteries that are that are by their very nature unsolvable and as an artist and as an author and as someone who loves mysteries like campfire stories to be to be immersed in exactly that and to my i make a bad joke which is not a joke at all because it's true i say you know how do i do my research i get up in the morning and i open my email inbox that's how i do my research that's all i do that's not entirely true but that that i use that to be purposely kind of provocative as far as like how this stuff just rains down on me so me as a character on a stage with all the people it's I'm not alone on that stage right there's other actors and actresses and and there's a, f- a flowing ever widening magical script and there's the person who hoists a curtain up at the beginning and there's the person who drops the curtain at the end and there's all the directors and the writers and the are they all me generating this magical experience for myself as someone like Kirby surprise might speculate I don't know, but I can say that it has been very difficult at times. Yet stepping back and loosening my grip on the literal and being more content with the metaphorical, I'm I'm grateful for this difficult and rewarding chapter of my life. For more information on Mike Cleland, check the show notes. My gratitude to you, patrons and plusers. Expect your complimentary jetpacks by the end of this episode. Minus listeners, await your angry camel. Patrons and plusers, awake 
in the cloud forests of Guatemala to the mellifluous song of a slate-colored solitaire. Minus listeners are losing their hearing because an angry camel spit anthrax in their ear. Patrons and plusers play Sonny Crockett and Rico Tubbs in the reboot of Miami Vice. Minus listeners attend HOA meetings with mandatory assessments for code violations. Patrons and plusers pluck and partake of perfectly purple plums. Minus listeners suck a sack of ipecac. Patrons and plusers invented the word litaphoric, litafucking forically. Minus listeners say irregardless and etc. That's true. <laughs> to become a patron or a pluser, just click the link in the show notes. Remember, if you're ever trapped with a minus listener, just ask them to donate to a worthwhile cause and slink away in the fog of their paralysis. Aliens and Artists is brought to you by The Liminal Muse, offering one-on-one work with me, Stuart Davis. Sessions include past life regression, tools and practices for contact with non-human entities, creativity as a spiritual path, and more. Click the link in the show notes to book a session or go to theliminalmuse.com. One. Everything